are a culture, a society that is obsessed with the idea of love. Now, I didn't have to say we're a culture because this has always been true. We as a people, as humanity, are obsessed with love, are obsessed with relationships. Think through for a moment. Think through the movies that come out, the songs that come out. Think through the stories that are told and the books that are written. How many of them have to do with relationships going well or relationships going not so well? It's hard to find a movie, a song, a story that does not have some type of a love relationship in it. Why do they put all those things in our songs and movies and books and so on and so forth? Because as humanity, we're obsessed with the idea of love. In fact, I came across this, it's been a few years now, but it's simply entitled, Everything I Need to Know About Love I Learned from Pop Culture. There might be something good here. It says, some say in love, it is a river, an eternal flame, a total eclipse of a heart. It's misty, water-colored memories. It's a tale as old as time. There's mad love, blind love, burning love, puppy love, big love, endless love. There's even crazy, stupid love. <laughs> love can make you go on 50 first dates. Or... Wait for a stranger on top of the Empire State Building or hold up a boombox in somebody else's lawn. Love can make you walk 500 miles, run back and forth across the country for three years, take the midnight train to Georgia, pick New York over Stanford, or tie a thousand balloons to your house. Love can touch you one time and last for a lifetime. And love can make the old lady drop it in the ocean at the end. Love means never having to say you're sorry. Although you probably should, because love is a battlefield. You can get addicted to love. Love is a wicked game. Love hurts. But when you've lost that loving feeling, when you've had enough of silly love songs, and when you're wondering, What's love got to do with it? <laughs> Just remind yourself to stop in the name of love. <laughs> because you can't hurry love. Love takes time. So try a little tenderness. Put a little love in your heart. Give a little bit. And remember that love is all you need. Because all you need is love, actually. <laughs> we're obsessed with love how many of those references did you get because they struck a chord they connected with you in some way and the beautiful thing about this truth we need to ask this question whenever there's a value that we hold as close to universally as we can get we need to ask why is that there and the answer all too often is something like this. God designed us to be obsessed with love. It was his idea. He's not surprised by any of it. Why would God create us with such a great desire for love, with such a great desire for relationships, so that we would find it in him and with each other? God designed us with a craving for love, a craving for connectedness, a craving for relationship, so that we would find that connectedness in him and so we would find that connectedness with each other. And once again, this is nothing new and this is surprising to no one. It is not a new thing that we've been obsessed with love. Love is as old as the history of humanity is. And so let's ask a question. If we are and have always been obsessed with love, how are we doing? How are we doing walking out our desire for love and connecting us with each other? I think the short answer goes something like this. Not well. Our culture, when it comes to love and relationships, our culture is floundering. 
And one of the main reasons is that our culture teaches and believes so many myths about love that it brings pain to all those who adhere to them. The myths that our culture teaches us about love, they don't bring love, they bring pain. I can't tell you how many people I've interacted with, and maybe you have too, oh, my shoes in time, and maybe you have too, that their deepest regrets, their deepest sources of shame even in their life have to do with love. And if you were to ask them, hey, if you could get, do one thing over again in life, if you could push the reset button on one thing and try again, what would it be? So often the answer has something to do with love, something to do with a relationship with each other. And this breaks my heart. You know, we're talking about youth, our youth group meeting tonight, 23 teenagers, it's amazing. The messaging that's modeled, that's sent for our teens about what love is, about what it means to date, to have a relationship, it breaks my heart. They're taught that the way to experience fulfillment in love, the way to get joy out of relationships is to date as many people as you can. And if someone doesn't fulfill some desire you have, move on. It's such a shallow understanding of what it means to love, what it means to have a relationship. And it breaks my heart. And it's not just teenagers that struggle with this. Adults, we struggle with walking in love towards each other, with walking in romantic love with a partner. So many times when we approach love, we approach relationships without really thinking about it. We just walk in and assume everything will be all right. It'll work itself out. If it's meant to be, it'll be. But instead, so many of us, we've never had someone come alongside of us and ask us questions about our relationships, ask us questions about our love for someone. No one comes alongside and asks us, have you thought that through? There's some red flags here. Are you seeing them? No one comes alongside and they've asked, have you seen this work out before? Whatever dynamic you're experiencing, have you seen it work out before? People don't come alongside and they ask, did anyone warn you about this person or about some character trait that they have? Did anyone warn you? And some of us were lucky enough to have someone in our lives that's willing to ask us those tough questions. But all too often, the response that we give to those questions is something like, oh, but he's different. Oh, but she's different. This time, it's different. If we're lucky enough to have someone that's willing to point out red flags in our relationships, too often we simply excuse them. And it breaks my heart to see the pain, the pain that we walk through in this. You see, the reason, one of the reasons why we're talking about this today, I don't want any of us to live the story of a liar I don't want any of us to live a lie. I don't want us to live our lives now in such a way so that one day, if you're not married now and if you're seeking marriage, one day when you find someone that you want to be with long-term, you want to spend the rest of your life with, I don't want you to live in such a way now that you feel like you have to hide that part of your story, put on a face so that you don't scare them off. And for those of us who, who are married, maybe you've been married for a few days or a few decades, somewhere in between, I don't want you to feel like, I can't let them know this about me. If they knew that, they would reject who I am. The way that we avoid living a lie, having our life story become a lie, is we live with integrity all the way through. We make choices now that we know years from now we can look back and we won't look with shame. We won't look with regret. So often the messaging that we hear goes something like this. Pursue a dating relationship. Pursue a marriage. And in order to make sure it works out, make sure you control that person. Manipulate that person. Here are some ways, in fact, you can find this on the internet all over the place, something along the lines of how to get your spouse, husband, wife, whatever, how to get your spouse to do what you want, how to get them to whatever it happens to be. As if the whole point of a marriage or the whole point of dating is to try to trick this person into doing the things that you want them to do. 
without any regard for their own desires, their own wants. It breaks my heart. Earlier, I said that our culture teaches myths that bring pain to relationship, myths that promise life, but instead bring anything but. I'm going to share just two of them with you this morning. One of them is this, simply called the right person myth. And from the name of this, you could probably guess what it is or guess what it means. The right person myth goes simply like this, something like, as soon as I find the right person, we'll know it We'll have those butterflies in our stomach. We'll sail off into the sunset, and everything will be perfect. Has anybody met the right person, and then after a little while realized they ain't perfect? Now, if you're a spouse in here, don't raise your hand. That's going to make dinner more complicated for you. You see, we buy into this right person myth, and so we find the right person. We find the person that we look forward to spending time with, the person that we look forward to talking with. We spend hours on the phone with them. We find the person who laughs at our jokes, the person who seems like, I can never get mad at them. And so we get married. And for a season, a honeymoon, a sweet month, if you break that down, oh, we're on cloud nine. Nothing could be nicer. And then one evening, you're standing at the sink and you're brushing your teeth. And you can look over and you realize, what end of the toothpaste did you squeeze to get that out? Or you go into the restroom and you notice, why do they put the toilet paper on that way? It's supposed to go this way. Or even worse, do they not know how to take the roll off and put it on? Why is it sitting right there? Or maybe... When you were dating and then married, the way your spouse cooked for you and the way they had this ability to burn water, it was cute and adorable. Until one evening, you've been working hard all day and you come home and you sit down for dinner and you're trying to chew through whatever that happens to be and you just can't do it anymore. One day when you realize this right person isn't the perfect person I thought it would be, or thought they would be, then we come to the conclusion they must not have been the right person after all. And my right person is waiting for me out there. And so we disconnect from this right person so that we could go find another right person. And God forbid we find a coworker or a neighbor or someone at the store or at the gym and they laugh at our jokes. And the whole cycle repeats itself over again. The right person myth. We, the idea that we have to find when we fall in love with someone that means that we have met the right person. Do you know what's required to fall in love? One thing, a pulse. <laughs> if you're alive, you can fall in love. Those things go hand in hand. Do you know what's required to stay in love? That's a whole lot more than a pulse. Do you know what's required to stay in love for year after year after year through sickness, through health, through richer for poorer, through happy moods and grumpy moods, through in-laws, through all of the things? A whole lot more than a pulse. One of the major myths that we hear is this right person myth. Another myth that we hear, and I came up with this creative title, I kind of like it. It goes like this. It's the wedding fixes all myth. Yes, I'm dating someone and we have our problems, but as soon as we walk down that aisle and as soon as we stand in front of the altar, everything's going to be hunky-dory. Don't need to worry about our arguments anymore. Don't need to worry about our character flaws anymore. Don't need to worry about the things the other person does that drives me nuts. They'll all go away. As soon as I get married, as soon as we make a promise, life becomes easy. Promises... They're amazing, and we need them, and we need to live by them. But a promise never takes the place of preparation. If we were to talk about this in any other realm of life besides relationships, it is obvious 
If you get hired on at a company and your boss says, I promise within the next year, we're going to be the world's leading supplier of whatever widget it happens to be. And you say, oh, that's great. How are we going to do it? And he says, well, I promised. What else do you want? Don't you believe in me? Why don't you trust me? No one would sit through a job like that. We would want preparation over a promise. If, you're, if you went on the sports team, if you tried out for the football team in high school, and if your coach says, hey, in order to make the team, you need to run this fast, jump this high, pick up this much weight, and make sure you can do that by the fall. And you say, oh, don't worry, coach. I promise. And then that summer, you never darken the door of a gym, never put on tennis shoes. And you show up and you say, coach, I'm ready. I promised. It doesn't work. But yet in relationships, we so often feel like we don't need to prepare. We don't need preparation for life with another person. Well, once we make a promise, then everything will just work itself out. Love will find a way. And when we find out all too often after the wedding, after the ceremony, after the reception and the honeymoon and all these things, that wedding didn't fix those things in me that I hoped it would. Because when we get married, do you know who we bring into our marriage? Ourselves. That wedding doesn't change any of those things. The wedding fixes all myth brings so much pain to our society. We are obsessed with love. And if we're to take a look at our culture and look at just our, our snapshot of how we are doing with love, I think we would have to respond something like, we're not doing well. We need some help with this. So let's ask this question. If we're obsessed with love and if we're not doing well as a society, as a culture, if the culture's messaging about love is a bunch of myths that bring pain, well, what is God's messaging? Does God have something to say about love and intimacy and relationships? And the answer is a resounding yes. You see, God creates a whole new paradigm for dating, for marriage, for lifelong intimacy. And when I say whole new, that's probably a misnomer because it's been around as long as humanity has been around as well. God's paradigm for love, God's paradigm for relationships, for pursuing joy and peace through the ups and the downs, through the joys and the griefs of relationship has been around forever. But we so often miss it. Today, we're beginning a series simply entitled An Old Fashioned Love Song. We're going to spend the next few weeks looking at God's paradigm for love, God's paradigm for dating, for marriage, for intimacy, for lifelong marriages, lifelong love relationships, and what God has to say about that. Now, before we jump in, I just want to make a couple of disclaimers up front. One, who is this marriage for? Who is this series for? We might get the idea that says, oh, pastor's talking about dating. I'm married. Wake me up in just a few minutes and we'll go get lunch. That doesn't work. This series is for those who are dating or who want to date. It is for teenagers that are trying to figure out what does life look like. It's also for those who are dating maybe for the first time or those who are dating again due to some major change in their life. This series is for those who've been married, married for a week, married for 50 years. This series is for those who have kids or grandkids or nieces or nephews or interact with anyone who is involved in a dating or marriage relationship. This series is for anyone who wants to know God's heart for us on a whole deeper level through a book of the Bible that so often skipped or ignored completely. You see, we're going to walk through a book in the Bible called the Song of Songs. If you have an older translation, it might refer to it as the Song of Solomon. Same book, just different titles throughout that. There's a whole thing there that we won't get into. This book of the Bible, I believe, is the only book that has the privilege of being officially censured by the church. And what I, and when I say officially, 
I mean it. You see, in the 6th century, there was a church council, the Council of Constantinople, where they would come together and they're discussing what's correct doctrine, what's correct ways to interpret the Bible, things of that nature. When they came through the Song of Songs, they looked at each other and said, I don't know what to do with that. What do you want to do with it? Well, I don't know what to do with it. And so they banned, they officially banned a literal interpretation of this book. As we read the book, and it's going to be this expression of love between a man and his wife, we're going to look at it, and they said, no, nah, that makes us a little queasy. Instead, it's going to be about something totally different. It's about God's love for his people, which is beautiful. Don't get me wrong. But I think there's something else going on in this book. The Song of Songs has the privilege of being skipped over by so many very few followers of Jesus have read it. Even fewer have heard a sermon preached on it because it deals with topics that we just kind of figure, you know, that's a little awkward for church. Let's talk about something different instead. Now, as we navigate this series, and by the way, it's been pointed out to me more than once this week, something along the lines of, Pastor, do you realize... You're starting a series on intimacy through the Song of Songs, and our fifth graders are now in the room with us. Yes, I realize. I also know what the fifth graders are talking about at school. I also know, because we're heavily involved in a Christian school here in town, what they're talking about at the Christian school here in town. This is a series for all of us. Now, with that in mind, I do want it just out of a sense to try to honor parents that are trying to navigate when's the right time to talk about what with their kids. Today's message, I should have put a little rating on the screen. That would have been hilarious. Today, we're at that GPG kind of level. Next week, we're going to be at that PG-13 level. We're not going to get beyond that. But yeah, so just uh, you know, do with that as you will. Uh, that's kind of where, where all of those things are. Let's look up this book of the Bible that has scared so many, and let's read some of it. If you have your Bibles, open them up to the Song of Songs. If you're using one of our Bibles in the chairs there, it's on page 672. The Song of Songs, 672. And we're going to start reading from the very beginning. Chapter 1, verse 1, 672. And this is, oh, and before we dive in, if you have, like I said, a newer translation, you'll notice, and if you're using one of the Bibles in the chairs, it has portions of the song split out into, it says something like she and friends and she and he all the way through. Because this song, this poem, this is a drama. This is a play that was acted out, that was sung as they were presenting. And so they broke up the lines into, this is what the female would say. This is what the male would say. And then there was typically a chorus that goes along with poetry in this style. And so that chorus would be friends. And so as we have it on the screen, you'll notice I put he or she in parentheses. That's who folks think is speaking at that moment. Those aren't, the he's and the she's aren't part of the text. They're just a gift to try to help us understand the, the text a little bit better. Song of Songs, chapter 1, verse 1. This is what it says. Solomon's Song of Songs. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the young women love you. Take me away with you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers. We rejoice and delight in you. We will praise your love more than wine. How right they are to adore you. Dark am I, yet lovely, daughters of Jerusalem. Dark like the tents of Kedar, like the tent curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards. My own vineyard I had to neglect. Tell me, you whom I love, where you graze your flock and where you rest your sheep at midday. 
Why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? If you do not know, most beautiful of women, follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your young goats by the tents of the shepherds. I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with strings of jewels. We will make you earrings of gold studded with silver. While the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh resting between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyards of En Gedi. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes are doves. How handsome you are, my beloved. Oh, how charming in our bed is verdant. The beams of our house are cedars, our rafters are firs. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily among the valleys. Like a lily among thorns is my darling among the young woman, young women. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my beloved among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. Let him lead me to the banquet hall, and let his banner over me be in love. Strengthen me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. His left arm is under my head, and his right arm embraces me. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. You might see why folks get a little queasy about the Song of Songs. You see, I read portions of Scripture like this, and my response goes something like, and people say the Bible is boring. Oh, that's a pet peeve of mine. You think the Bible is boring? Read the Song of Songs or the Book of Judges for a whole different reason why the Bible ain't boring. But that's another conversation for another day. Notice in this passage all the images that go to gardens, all the images that go to vineyards, to plants, to animals. You see, all the way back in the beginning of God's story, in the book of Genesis, there was another garden. And in that garden, there was a man and a woman who lived in perfect harmony with each other and with God. And then one day, in that garden, that garden of Eden, sin came in. And the man and the woman turned their backs on God and turned their backs on on each other. And part of the curse that came from that, part of the curse that came from sin, that came from that man and that woman turning their backs on God and turning their backs on each other, is their relationship went from one of openness and honesty and vulnerability with each other to one where each person was trying to control the other person. God made this explicit in Genesis chapter 3 when he said that the man will rule over his wife and the wife will seek to rule over her husband. The Song of Songs, it invites us to this vision of a male and a female relationship that is not touched by a desire to control. There is no hint of dominance in this relationship with each other. Instead, as you heard, the man and the woman completely open with each other, open with their desires for each other, vulnerable with each other. The Song of Songs invites us to a vision of a married relationship of a husband and a wife, where the husband's not trying to dominate his wife, the wife's not trying to control her husband, but instead they're coming together for a mutual joy of simply being together. It invites us into a vision of male and female relationships that, if we're honest with ourselves for one moment, goes so against what we often see and experience today. The Song of Songs invites us to something far grander in our love relationships, in our intimate relationships than we could ever imagine. Now, we could go through and pick apart this chapter all day, But instead of doing that, I want to point out just a couple of things. A couple of things about seeking a person. If you're here, if you're not married, and if you're dating, or if you're wanting to date, these are some things to look for, some things to keep in mind. If you are married, 
Remember, when we say I do, that doesn't mean we stop dating. We keep dating. We just date with a ring on. That's, that's the difference right there. And so these are things we want to keep in mind as we seek to bless our spouse. The first is this. Notice how he built her up and completely changed her view of herself. If we look at the beginning of this passage, chapter 1, verse 5, she says this. Dark am I, yet lovely, daughters of Jerusalem. Dark like the tents of Kedar, like the tent curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. In some sense, she's ashamed of her appearance. Don't stare at me. Don't look at me. I'm not worth being looked at. And in between there, her hubby comes along. You are beautiful, my darling. Your eyes are like doves. He says, you're a mare among, chari- among Pharaoh's chariot horses. Not quite sure what that means. <laughs> Try it out. (laughs) Maybe it'll work. I don't know. She says, don't look at me. I'm dark. I'm ugly. I'm not worth your attention. He says, you are beautiful. And then notice her change in perspective in chapter 2 and verse 1. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. He had changed her perspective of herself. His words had changed her thoughts about how she appeared, about her appearance, about who she was as a woman. In our dating and married relationships, it's so easy to use our words to point out to the other person how much they drive us nuts and how much they can't do this or that or the other, and how they have that ability, that supernatural ability to burn the water that we didn't even think was possible when they're cooking. Or we can use our words to help the other change their perspective of themselves. I've heard it said, especially when it comes to relationships, so much truth doesn't ever need to be said. It could be true. In fact, I guarantee it. It's not could be. It is true. Your spouse, your partner has flaws. But remember, they already know them. They've sat in them. They're aware of them. They don't need us to come along and point out, oh, hey, by the way, here's something new that I noticed that you stink at. They need their spouse, their partner, their other to come alongside and say, no, 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 no. Look at how amazing you are. Look at how beautiful you are. Imagine for a moment what a difference our marriages would be, how different our relationships would look like if we sought to be friendly to our spouse or to our dating partner and whatever the relationship looks like. Remember, One of the most often neglected, uh, often disobeyed command throughout all of Scripture. It's a really simple one. It goes like this. Be kind to one another. You see, over time, whatever we tell our spouses, what we tell our partners, if we tell it to them enough, they're going to start to internalize those things. What are we telling them? Tell them that they're beautiful, that they're amazing. Tell them that you're proud of them. Tell them you're so grateful that they're in your lives and see what a change that makes to their personality, to their countenance, to their view and their feeling about themselves. In a healthy relationship, we build up the other. We point out the good in the other. In a healthy relationship, we're not ashamed of the other, not ashamed of them in private. We're not ashamed of them in public. In chapter 2, verse 4, she is speaking, and she says, Let him lead me to the banquet hall. Let his banner over me be love. Very public places. He's not ashamed of her. He doesn't care if everybody knows that they're together. He doesn't try to hide his feelings for her. He doesn't try to hide their relationship, and neither does she. They want people to know that they are together. Sometimes I see people that have this habit 
where they're with their wife or their husband and they're one person. And then when they're at work, they're someone totally different. And what they do sometimes is it looks like this. As they're walking into work, they get there and they take this and they put it in their pocket. Not a great plan, to say the least. Or they get there and they don't want people to know. Maybe they want them to know I'm in a relationship, but maybe not with that one. In a healthy, in a fulfilling relationship, dating, courting, married, whatever it is, we're not ashamed of that person. We're not, ashamed, we're not scared that people might find out that we're with them. Instead, well, he puts his banner over her for all to see. This is my beloved. His banner over me is love. Finally for today, once again, there's so many. In a healthy relationship, in a fulfilling relationship, it, re it, help it reminds us to build up the other. It reminds us to not be ashamed of the other. It reminds us to wait. Look at chapter 2, verse 7. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, by the gazelles and by the does of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. We'll talk about this more next week, but just to blink for today, the way I phrased it with folks, it goes something like this. We don't do married people things until we're married. Then we do married people things. But unless we're married, we don't do married people things. Why? Because we're not married. And those are married people things. Now, it's a convoluted sentence that I do not want to diagram, but you get the gist of it. You get the idea. True, joy-filled, and loving relationships, the song of songs, this love that it pictures, this passion between a man and a woman, it reminds us we wait until the appropriate time. We wait until the proper time to arouse love, to awaken, so that that love becomes a blessing, not a curse. I've sat just through my role as a pastor. Part of that comes with counseling, things like that, which I love. I love counseling. I've sat with so many who have said something like this. I wish we wouldn't have rushed in. I wish we would have waited. You know what I've never heard? I'm so sorry that we waited. I wished we would have jumped in together and not waited to be married. I've never heard someone re express regret over that. I've heard a lot of regret expressed over not waiting. You see, do you feel that tension there? Do you sense that? There's wisdom in what the song shares with us. Now, as part of this series, what we're going to do is each Sunday, I'm in I've invited a couple from various stages, various seasons of life to come and to share what it looks like in their life to seek to intentionally bless the other, to love the other person. What does that look like in their own dynamic? The idea being several reasons. The big idea being we all express these things with each other differently, and that's okay. And so sometimes it's, it's, it's helpful to see another couple and just to hear, well, how do they show their love for each other? And then maybe that inspires some things within us and reminds us, whatever season of life we're in, we want to express our love and our devotion for the other. That's what a healthy relationship looks like. And so this morning, would you join me? Let's welcome Jacques and Michaela right up here to the platform. All right, that's on. Now, Jacques and Michaela, you're going to celebrate your one-year anniversary on... I put them on the test. Did you notice that? July... Hold it up closer. Get it up there. July 8th. July. <laughs> they take a whole month for their anniversary. It's, it's July. I love it. All right, I'm going to get my water bottle. Just tell us some things. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. We were going to go with the question of uh, uh, how do we intentionally seek to uh, love each other? And um, I guess we're going to talk about that for a second here. Uh, yeah, so I think um, when loving each other and being in a relationship, the first important thing to remember is uh, what the purpose of our relationship is. And it isn't uh, our happiness. Uh, our marriage isn't to make me feel better, to make Jacques feel better. It's not for us to build each other up. Um, our marriage is a tool 
that we use to glorify God. And that's the primary purpose. And a byproduct of that is uh, getting to love each other well and the joy that comes from that. Um, the second thing is understanding our roles uh, as a reflection of Christ in the church and what that looks like. Uh, I think Jacques wanted to read the verse that talks about that. Uh, yeah, I just want to talk about Ephesians uh, 5, 25, uh, or 22 through 25. Uh, just wives uh, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord and for husbands is the head of the house the head of the uh, wife even as Christ is the head of the church uh, his body and himself as its savior uh, now as the church submits to Christ also wives should submit in everything to their husbands so because we're working as a reflection of Christ in the church um I can honor Jacques even when I feel like he is not worthy of being honored um, because whether or not that's true, because Christ is worthy of honor ultimately. And he can love me even if he feels like I'm not worthy of love because Christ loves the church. Um, practically what that looks like, I think it's all in the little things. I think uh, whether it's cleaning up or doing dishes that I don't feel like doing, I can use that as an opportunity to honor Jacques because Christ is worthy of honor, even if I don't feel like it. Um, another thing for me is I've noticed I've been in situations with other married women where the conversation becomes like a competition of whose husband is the most annoying. Um, <laughs> and it's it feels really easy to want to contribute to that, but that's not being respectful of Jacques. Um, so for me, like that's a big thing is making sure I'm being respectful of him in all situations and uh, no matter what. Yeah, I, I just want to also just say, just saying like, I love Michaela because Christ ultimately deserves that. And so just finding other ways just to say, um, I love Michaela and showing her just, uh, so Michaela's in law school right now. So Michaela spends a lot of time at the library. So just different, like quick example, sometimes I'll go and uh, after work, come home, and then I'll just either get Michaela's favorite Chick-fil-A stuff over to her for dinner or just some other small stuff along there. If I can try to take off my laziness and try to help clean up in the kitchen, something like that, too. So just examples like that, too. Show. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. I'll take it. Oh, thank you. I love it. Remember, throughout all of July, wish them a happy anniversary. Um, <laughs> I'm getting to know Jacques. Jacques comes to a, a Tuesday morning Bible study that we have. They're all kinds of good people. Love them. You see the high calling that it is to love. And I love what you said, McKayla. It reminded me of a book that I can't remember the title, but I remember the subtitle. And it said, what if marriage wasn't meant to make you happy, but was meant to make you holy. And then as we pursue holiness, a byproduct of that is happiness. Beautiful exposition. I should have let y'all preach a sermon. We are obsessed. We are wired to pursue love. Our culture sends us so many myths about it that bring so much pain. God presents a picture of it far grander than we could ever imagine. How do we live in that picture? This is where the message of Jesus brings life. The message of Jesus takes the burden off of us completely, takes a burden of performance, takes a burden of regret, of shame, takes a burden that says I have to live up to some standard. It takes all of those things off and it replaces it with something totally different. You see, Jesus, right before he went to the cross, he's having his last supper, his last dinner with his closest disciples. And if you know that you're having the last conversation you'll ever have before you die with someone whom you love dearly, what are you going to tell them? You're going to tell them the most important stuff. And as part of that, Jesus says this in John 15. Go ahead and put that up there. He says, well, I'll flip to it. There it is. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Pause there. Jesus gives us a totally different paradigm of love. 
as the Father has loved me, just imagine for a moment how much must God the Father love God the Son. Imagine the love that they have enjoyed with each other from eternity past into eternity future. Imagine this love that different parts of the Godhead have shared for each other. And Jesus says, in the exact same way, just as the Father has loved me, I have loved you. What have we done to be worthy of such love? Nothing. This is a totally different paradigm from love. A paradigm that says, I will love you regardless of if you're worthy of it or not. I will love you regardless of if you live up to some standard, if you meet some expectation, if you do all the things I want you to do or not. It's a love that says, I love you. Period. End of sentence. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Next. Now remain in my love. How do we live out this love relationship with Jesus, with the Father? We remain in the love that he already gives us. Do you see how this totally, how this radically shifts our ideas, our understanding of love today? Jesus says, now remain in my love. Okay, how do I do that? Next one. If you keep my commands you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. Can I confess something to you for just a moment? The first time or two or ten that I read this when I was first starting to follow Christ, and I saw Jesus say, as the Father has loved me, I have loved you, and I go, oh, it's beautiful, and remain in my love. And I go, yes, Jesus. And then He says, now keep my commands. What? (laughs) Is Jesus saying, it, 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 it sounds like a manipulative twist a little bit. If you want me to love you, better keep my commands. And let me just say, if you're in a relationship and if someone says something like, if you want me to love you, you'll do what I say, leave, just run. That's that's not healthy. Jesus isn't doing some sort of of a manipulative twist. He's making a matter of fact statement. If we love him, we'll do the things he calls us to do. If you love your spouse, as Jacques McKayla told us, you naturally do things that show you love them, that show you respect them, that show you want to be a part of their life. Jesus is saying, if this is how you know if you're remaining in my love, if you keep my commands, just as I have kept my Father's commands. Jesus is not telling us to do something he's unwilling to do. He's calling us into a love relationship that he's already a part of, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Now, what, is the, what do these commands lead to? Put the next one up there. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. You want to have joy in your loving relationships, joy in your intimacy, joy with your spouse, with your dating partner? You want to have complete joy that comes from remaining in the Father's love, that comes from remaining in Christ's love, so that your joy may be complete. Well, if Jesus tells us to keep his commands, and he gives us the reason, this is why the path, the reason why I want you to keep this command so that you can have all the joy that's ever even possible, this command must be something good. Well, what is it? Put the next one. My command is this. Love each other as they have loved you. Love each other as they deserve to be loved. Love each other as they have earned in your eyes. Love each other as I have loved you. You've heard the golden rule, treat others as you wish to be treated. This is so much beyond that. This is the platinum rule. Love one another as God in Christ has loved you. What type of love has Christ shown us? He loves us. He loves us when we wake up grumpy. He loves us when we fall apart. 
He loves us when we make that promise that says we'll never return to that addiction, we'll never yell again, we'll never do all the things we don't want to do, but then we wake up one morning and we realize that's what we just spent the yesterday doing. He loves us. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. What if the banner over our marriages was this? They love each other just as Christ loves them. How much joy, how much peace, how much fulfillment would be in that home, would be in that relationship? They love each other, not as they deserve, not as they have earned, not as even he loves her as much as she loves him and not a penny more. They love each other just as God in Christ has loved them. That's the beauty behind a whole new paradigm shift. And so when it comes to dating, when it comes to marriage, instead of trying to find the right person, because that's the right person myth, instead of banking on a wedding ceremony to fix everything, instead, we should seek to become the person. What kind of person? Become the person, if you're not married, that the person you're looking for is looking for. Instead of trying to find that just right person that makes you happy in all the right ways and is excited about the things that you're excited about, putting all the onus on them to make sure they measure up to this much, not this and not this, but this, instead of that, focus on becoming the person that the person you're looking for is looking for. If you're married, we're going to rephrase this. Focus on becoming the person your spouse is dreaming of. Focus on becoming that person that your spouse is excited to come home to, is excited to see again. Don't be that person that your spouse signs up for overtime just so they don't have to come home. Don't be that person to where your spouse says, I can't share this with them. I don't know how they'll react. Don't be that become the person that your spouse is dreaming of. That's the invitation of the Song of Songs. That's the invitation the Lord gives us by taking our view of love and intimacy and relationships and lifelong intimacy and taking it to where we think it's this much and we think that's amazing. The Lord says, oh, it's far beyond anything you could ever imagine in this lifelong journey, with its joys, with its griefs. It's more than we could ever imagine. Worship band, would you come up here, wherever you are? In a series like this, I'm not unmindful of the fact that so many of us in this room have been hurt deeply by love or by a failed relationship or by a beautiful relationship that ended prematurely through death. I'm not unaware of the pain and of the grief that can come from simply having this conversation. And so I wanna pray. The Lord is not unaware either. If you've been sitting through this message, gritting your teeth, because you're just trying to make it through, the Lord sees you. The Lord knows you. He knows your pain. He knows your hurt. And he is there with you. He is for you. As we sang earlier, the Lord is our comforter. The Lord is our healer. The Lord is the one who binds up our wounds. The Lord is the one that takes our hearts that are hurting and seals them with himself, seals them with his Holy Spirit. He's not unaware of our pain. He's not unaware of our grief. He wants to meet us in the midst of it. And so I want to pray and let's pray. Lord, I pray this morning. As we hear these messages, as we look through the Song of Songs, as we see this high and this beautiful picture of love that you paint, 
this picture of love that is not tinged by our sinful desires to dominate the other person or to control the other person or to use the other person for some other gain, some other end. But instead, this picture that you paint of two people who have come together in a romantic, intimate relationship and they've come together forever, forever seeking the welfare of the other, forever seeking to bless, to respect the other. As you paint this picture of people coming together for the beauty and the joy of simply being in the presence of of the other, Lord, we could see that and we can realize how much our experience has differed from that. And it can hurt. And so, Lord, today we bring you our hurts. We bring you our pain. We bring you our griefs, our griefs over our romantic relationships. We bring them to you. Because only you can make us whole, oh Lord. The only way we can find joy and find complete joy, we don't find complete joy in any relationship, in any marriage, because we weren't intended to find it there. We only find it in you. We only find the fulfilled life as we live it with you. And so, Lord, I pray for all of us gathered here, for those that are hurting, for those that have maybe their biggest regrets in life have something to do with a loving relationship. Lord, would you bind their wounds this morning? Would you lift up their eyes this morning? Just like that man did to that woman in this song where her view of herself was nothing but ugly and dirty and not worthy of love. And he lifted her up to say, I am worthy of my partner's love. Lord, would you lift up our eyes that we might see ourselves the way you see us. You don't see us as shameful. You don't see us as ugly. You don't see us as dirty and as distant from you. You see us as the apple of your eye. And Jesus, as the Bible tells us, you are not ashamed to call us your brothers and sisters. That your banner over us is one of love. And you want all the world, all the universe to know how much you love us. And so, Lord, for those that are hurting, bring healing this morning. Lord, for those who are celebrating all the joy that they can within their relationship, Lord, Would you lift them up even more? Help our joy be complete in you. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We are so thankful for you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, I want to ask you, please stand. Let's close out our gathering by worshiping together.